All right. So this question says, an airplane flying horizontally with some speed. Let me start marking. Uh, v not at a height of 786 meters. Uh, oh, I actually, I guess I can mark it this way. V not. It's at a. I normally I would sketch out the situation here. I have a figure, so let me use that. It's a flying at some height. Uh, drops a crate of supplies. Yes, a figure below. If the parachute fails to open, how far in front of the really does the crate hit the ground? And you know, even if the parachute fails to open, it could reach terminal velocity and whatnot. Um, for the sake of making the problem solvable, I'm going to assume that air resistance is negligible. It's probably not a good assumption in this case. But um, if I don't assume that, the problem is not solvable. So <laughs> knowing that it's probably not a good assumption, I'm still going to assume that air resistance is negligible so that I can get some rough estimate of where it might be. And if the situation matters, you can do numerical simulation to take air resistance into account. So, so with the, all the projectile motion questions, I'm going to... Um, Let's see, how do I put it? So let me actually <laughs> finish this part. So it's asking how far in front of the release does it, it uh, hit the ground? So it's uh, asking for this distance here. This is what we usually call range, uh, horizontal distance along the ground. And uh, as I'm trying to find this range, I'm going to go through the usual considerations for projectile motion, which is the the two, um, maybe the most important equations uh, when you are working with the projectile motion that comes from the kinematics equations for constant acceleration with the simplifying co uh, considerations of projectile motion that the horizontal acceleration is zero and the vertical acceleration is known and it's minus g. It's downward at g. Um, and, and really, the reason I'm assuming air resistance is negligible is so that I can use this. Because if air resistance was significant, this wouldn't be the case. And it will be complicated. So with these simplifying uh, conditions, I can say my the horizontal position or x component of displacement is given by, as a function of time, some initial position plus my horizontal component of velocity, which will be constant, times time. And my y component of position, displacement, is as a function of time, some initial position plus the initial y velocity. Here I have to specify initial because y velocity will be changing, times time, minus one half gt squared. So as I look at the range, that's a horizontal change in position. So it's going to be related to this horizontal position. So I start to say, OK, range, it's going to be a horizontal position at some final time when it lands. And that will be uh, initial x position. Let me make things easy for myself and just say this line is where x is equal to 0. So that I don't have to have an initial x position. So 0 plus. And my x velocity, this crate, it's going to have an uh, inherited velocity from when it was being dropped. Uh, same as the velocity of the airplane that was dropping it. So I'll have this v naught of 500 kilometers per hour. I'm going to have to do a unit conversion later. Let me deal with that later. For now, I'll keep it in symbols. V naught times t final. So once I have the t final, then I can easily find the uh, range. Now, um, uh, in most, uh, in many of the projectile motion scenarios, you will find that the y component of the motion usually gives your time information. So I'm just gonna start working with it and see what happens. So the y component of motion at t final, I see that it has landed, so it's going to be at zero position at t final. Um, and my initial y, let me just make things simple for myself and say, this is my y equals zero. So my initial y height is the height h that the airplane was at, h. 
um, an initial component of y velocity here it looks like it's zero the plane is flying horizontally um, it's not being thrown down so plus zero times t final which is going to be zero minus one half gt final squared ah. so here i have a beautiful simplification because this is the only term with the t final i can solve for this term and then solve for t final without going through any um, quadratic equations or anything complicated like that so let me first solve this for one half gt final squared by moving this over to left hand side leaving everything else on the right hand side 1 half gt final squared is equal to h. And hopefully you have enough practice with algebra that the next step seems clear. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this whole thing by 2 divided by g. And then of the thing I get, I'm going to square root the whole thing. The intent of doing all this is I'm solving for t final. You know, 2 cancels out 1 half over g cancels out g, and square root uh, gets rid of that thing. And so I'm going to write down t final is equal to, and you know, do all these things in order to the right hand side. So 2 times h divided by g, square root of the whole thing. So that's my t final. Plug it in here. That'll get me the range. Let me write down the expression here. So the range will be, um, skipping zero v naught for which i have a number v naught times square root of 2h over g and uh, i said i'm going to do unique conversion um uh, let me not bother with that uh, let me show you a tool that's going to save you from the troubles of unit conversion so that tool is a tool from alpha you know, it's a, so I, I just like with the other algebra complicated questions, I do want you to know how to do it by hand. And I have done this by hand. You have, you have lecture videos of me doing unit conversion, so I don't need to prove to anyone else that I know how to do it by hand. Uh, so I'm just going to use Wolfram Alpha as a labor saving device. So 500 kilometers per hour um, times the square root of two times height. 786 meters divided by g 9.8 meter per second squared and one of the wonderful thing about Wolfram Alpha is a calculator is that it's a unit aware so it'll um, it'll do it'll recognize all these units and it'll do conversion uh, automatically so that the numbers it gives are dimensionally consistent it's uh, it's not gonna make uh, unit conversion errors that you or I might make if uh, we try to do it by hand so and uh, with Wolfram Alpha, you can double check the input, into, and you should double check input interpretation, make sure it correctly understood you. And if it looks right, then, you know, look at the answers. And if they had asked in kilometers, it'll be right there. If they had asked in, I don't know, length of Hindenburg Zeppelin, then there it is. <laughs> Here, I'm just going to put it in meters, 1759 meters. Uh, 1759 meters well i could have rounded it to 1760 but let me just use that so so yeah that's this question um if you want to learn how to do the unit conversion by hand uh, look for my video that i did for chapter one uh, that will show you how to do the unit conversion of 500 kilometers per hour to meters per second so that you can uh, plug in numbers all in the consistent units and if you want to save a little bit of time use all from alpha use of all from alpha is a lot whenever use of calculators a lot because that's all it is it's a very sophisticated calculator